I'm Kelsey Moser, and you're watching Thorne's YouTube channel, where no sandbagging goes unscrutinized. In a game like League of Legends, where the meta of the game itself changes from split to split, from year to year, and therefore players might be very good in one year, then not quite as good the next year, and then maybe even better a year afterwards, and people are trying to figure out what's the through line here, how much was adapting to the meta, how much was actual individual form, and how good this guy is, added to the fact that the circuit being such a limited number of incredibly uh, finite but decisive leagues and tournaments where when you win, you're the champion and people are just going to look back in history, see your team won, see you as the MVP, and they're going to have a hard time knowing the context. Like, were you the best champion of LCK of NALCS? Were you the luckiest champion of NALCS of LCK? People aren't going to know these things by default. And so it's very easy for people to fall into the trap of retconning. I mean, within the context of what we're talking about now in esports, I'm referring to the context of when people take something that we know about a player now, and then when they talk about his history before now, in the past, they rewrite what that past was like, taking into account what they know now, and sometimes as a result, making the player seem better than he was, making it seem as though he was always an elite player, or as though the jump up wasn't much, or maybe he was elite back then and his teammates were just bad, and that's why he's a very good player now. Or he might be a shit player now, and so they go back and go, how good could that team really have been, you know? And maybe when they had like a loss here, it shows that, you know, actually always he was a bad player. I mean, funnily enough, people do it in terms of retconning, into the present where what they'll do sometimes is there'll be a legendary player who was one of the greatest players in the world from his region, maybe even a champion. And they'll take this person and when he later on has a split or a streak of games that isn't very good, Faker is a great example of this, expect here. You don't hear that. People in their brain have this static fixed notion of Faker. And if SKT was ever the best, Faker was always the best player for them. He was always the best player in the world. He was always the best mid in the world. He was always the best Korean player. Like all these factors just get rolled up and suddenly you hear these stories as though like Faker was the best player, like bar none, undisputed, for like eight splits with or something, which he definitely wasn't. So it even happens with getting the future and, and taking positive past elements and rewriting the current part. Again, happens with a number of players, as I said. So the reason why I bring up KT Arrows as I think probably one of the best examples ever of this, and I've already seen many people, even very respectable people, top analysts, people who know a lot about League of Legends, do this same thing and retcon the KT Arrows lineup that won OGN. So the last ever season of OGN champions, the tournament run by On OnGameNet in South Korea, which was considered the premier Domestic tournament in the world because Korea was the best region in the world and because it's only Korean teams and it was a very difficult tournament in terms of you had to play best of fives from the round of eight to the quarter to the semifinals to the final. It actually was by many considered to be the hardest League of Legends tournament to win in the world. In theory, Worlds was easier because even though you have to play teams from China and LMS and Europe that you might not have played much and you might have a chance to get upset by, at the same time, you know who you're going to play in in Korea, there's more Korean teams. They're more familiar with your style. You've probably even scrimmed against them, played them in the past. And there are more elite Korean teams because as everyone knows, usually the fourth and fifth best Korean teams who typically don't go to Worlds because there's only three slots, actually can be better than the best teams from North America, Europe, and in the past, even China. So this was obviously an incredibly tough competition to win. And this was the last ever season when it was still just a tournament. When it came to season five, 2015, it became the LCK League Champions Korea, and then it became a league format. And obviously they used the gauntlet system for the playoffs. It was very, very different. OGN Champions had the single elimination, eight team bracket play, where, as I said, you have to win a quarterfinal, semifinal, and final to win the champion's title. So if we go and look at the lineup that KT Arrows had when they won this tournament, so we're talking about champions, 2014, summer, the reigning champions at the time was Samsung Blue, extremely strong team. You go and you look at the roster they had. Katie rolls to Arrows. They had Someday in the top lane. They had Kakao as Jungle. They had Rookie as mid laner. They had Arrow as AD Carry, and they had Hachani as the support player. So if we go and we look at this team, you know what, on paper, yeah, with what we know now with today's 2018 eyes, this looks like a fucking super team, right? This looks like a line. This must be a really strong team. Like, no wonder they won the tournament, you know? Fuck, why weren't they at Worlds that year? What a fucking amazing team this is, right? Because you think about what happened in the future, what we now know about those 
players and teams, right? So we've got someday here. Well, everyone knows someday a year later, when you go to Champions Summer and it's LCK time, he was part of the KT roster that's finished in second place in the regular split behind the incredibly dominant SK Telecom. So they're finishing ahead of Ku Tigers, who would have been the very good team in the spring. They're a team that once you get to the playoff portion, they managed to beat out the Ku Tigers. They beat them three to two. They get into the final. They lose to SK Telecom, but this was an incredibly dominant season for SK Telecom. SK Telecom went on to win Worlds. Many people cite that 2015 lineup as the best ever lineup of SK Telecom. So we know someday at this point in time, a monster, right? You go and look, he was the regular season MVP. They used to use the system where it was based by how many like player of the game type awards you want. He was the MVP of the summer split. Then at that point in time, obviously what a fabulously incredible player. He even had a pentakill in one of his games with Riven against Incredible Miracle. So what an amazing player, right? You know, later on, not only was he very good in all the KT Arrows teams he was in, particularly years after they won this uh, OGN tournament, but obviously playing for 100 Thieves this year, the guy's fucking amazing. Even when he was on Dignitas a year before that, he was still a very strong player on, quite frankly, not a very good team. So a guy who's been amazing, right? He was on this team. Then we go and look at Kakao. So we know Kakao at this point in time actually was in contention for best jungler in the world, like along with Dandy, quite frankly. It was a stylistic pick between the two, believe it or not, as to who you thought was better, because obviously Dandy had a better team overall and was more of like the team jungler, whereas Kakao was more of the carry jungler and had worse teammates around him in theory. But at the time, considered an MVP potential player of the league in 2014, one of the best players. After that, he obviously did part of the Korean exodus. He went over and played with Invictus Gaming. And then they had to make the choice between him, Rookie and Save, who they all had. They ended up kicking out Save. They went with Rookie and Kakao initially. They managed to get to Worlds that season. They did terribly. It was the famous one where they were in the group with Fnatic and AHQ and Cloud9. Didn't get out of the group. Famously, Kakao had that game on Skarna where he had like 900 or 600 damage or something. A terrible game. Ever since then, he wasn't even playing for Invictus Gaming most of the time. Eventually, he was on an LSPL team. Then somehow he got brought back to life and he got brought over to the Misfits team. I mean, it would have been when they were NIP, I think, right? There was NIP and there was Misfits and these players, these teams were using, actually, it doesn't make sense. They were two different teams. They, they were using these guys, using Kakao at this point in time, but he wasn't a very good player. He was considered very washed up. So he's actually the only player, really, that you can't really retcon being better. If anything, you have to remember that he was very good at the time. The rest of the players, you keep going through the lineup, they all have way better careers after this point in time, after winning arguably the best tournament of their careers, except for Rookie. Because you go and you look at Rookie, he's actually considered the best player in the world right now. He just won this tournament. He just won World Season 8. And he did it on a team that, okay, they lost two games to Fnatic in the group stage. After that, they went 3-2 to two against KT Rolls, the best Korean team, filled with superstar Hall of Fame players. They 3-0 G2, and then they 3-0 at Fnatic. He's considered the MVP of this tournament, Worlds. He's a world champion now. He already had won LCK when it was OGN with KT Arrows. He's been in the final of LPL. It's considered, yeah, the best player in the entire world right now. Elite player at his position for years, but primarily when he was in China, when he was in Victor's Gaming, and when often he didn't make it to Worlds. So he was winning MVPs over in China, even though at the time he wasn't coming close to winning Worlds. And he was a very, very good player, but this wasn't when it was in Season 4 and when he was on KT Arrows. Arrow himself, the AD carry, go to this tournament, NALCS season seven, spring in 2017. He was the MVP of the league because back then it was voted by the players and coaches and, and the commentary cut duos, etc. I will point out, by the way, if NALCS actually used the same MVP system that LCK does, Dardock would actually have been the MVP that season. And in fact, Arrow wouldn't even have been top five. But that's because he used a different system. I actually think generally, even though it's been voted for in, I think, quite a pathetic manner by people voting for their own teammates, generally, I actually think the, the system for voting for the MVP of LCS is actually superior to LCK. The idea of just player of the games, I think, is a very weird metric to use. So Arrow, later on, an, an MVP of NALCS. And then Hachani, okay, Hachani was never an elite player for my money at any point in time. But you know what? He got to come back. If you remember, he was on Rebels Anarchy. Then he came back to KT Rolster when it was season six, when actually most people had written them off. They thought this team wasn't going to do anything. And if you remember, season six, this is when they actually managed to beat out Samsung Galaxy, who obviously later on went to Worlds. They beat out 
SK Telecom 3-2. This is the first time SK Telecom had ever actually been beaten in a series by the KT Rolster guys. And then in the final, they lost narrowly in Game 5 to Rocks Tigers. And so almost won LCK to go with his Champions win from the years before. So certainly not the best player by any metric. Certainly not really an elite player. Now he had pretty good... MVP standings in the playoffs, okay, but again, something of a flawed metric. So you can see all these players have arguably more success or are considered good players individually beyond this. Everyone, basically, with the exception of Kakao, who's very good, and her Charlie was never that great a player anyway. So they all had times where that's what makes this seem like a super team, right? But you have to look at the context of the time, and that's actually one of the main issues I have at this point in time. Because when you look at the context of this exact time, summer of season four, so we're in 2014 now, okay, someday was a good top laner. He was showing some promise of that he was going to maybe become an elite top laner, but he wasn't the best top laner in the LCK at the time. Remember, they had, obviously, they had Flame still, save over a Najin White Shield, who'd just been to the finals in the previous uh, split previous champions tournament. You had Acorn over on Samsung Blue, who was the best team in Korea at the time. Some people would have counted Looper on Samsung White, Samsung Warzone. I'm not a big fan of him myself. You had a lot of very good top players at the time. Actually, it wasn't clear that someday was the best, or even really close to the best at that point in time. People weren't discussing him in this manner. He became elite, as I say, a year later when he became very sick. And after that, he's built a very, very respectable career for himself. One of the all-time great top lands for my money. Kakao, at this point in time, was his strongest MVP candidate, was never as good again any year after this. He's the only player, actually, that if anything, people retcon the other way and try to make him seem like he still had something to give years later when he was terrible. Rookie was a good player in Season 4. He certainly showed promise, but he wasn't a godlike mid yet. He wasn't really even considered in contention with Faker for best mid laner, really. He wasn't considered one of the best mid laners in the world. There was maybe some people who hyped him a little bit like that, but generally, you think, remember, the Samsung teams are still around. You still have Pawn and Dade, and you have Faker, even though, obviously, this is season five, when Faker, oh no, it's actually, this is when the Samsung teams are gone, I guess, so that doesn't make sense to do that. No, wait, this is season four, they do. Faker, obviously, was in his slump year, so, okay, fair enough, I guess Faker wasn't the best, I'm mixing up season five then. I guess at the time, people would have said Dade is the best mid laner, right? Some people would have said Pawn because of his great success against Faker. Goom over on Najin White Shield, who, as I said, were finalists the previous split. There were plenty of very good players. Coco over on uh, CJ at that point in time. It would have been CJ Frost was a very good mid laner, even though he hadn't peaked like he did the next year. You go and look at these players. Arrow, he was a good player at the time, but he was fairly inconsistent. There were still some very good players, such as the Samsung AD carry still in Korea. Hachari was all right. He made some missed players at times. He was probably the weakest player on the team. But you go and you look at the team, and you'll also see where the context of thinking like, well, these amazing players all on this team and the team won the hardest tournament and they even beat out some legendary teams. They must have been amazing, right? Let's go and look at the team and find out the context of who they were. So the KT Arrows were the sister team. They previously been called KTA until they were renamed KT Arrows. Sister team to KTB, which was renamed to KT Bullets for this season, for season four. And this was a team that had never done shit. Like, KTB had always been, despite the fact that A and B, the better of the teams. This is the team that had been to the final of OGN. This is the team that many thought was the second best team in the world the year before. This is the team that had been elite for a number of splits in Korea. KT Arrows was the team that had never done anything. Like, they the one where had taken on Macnoon and then that had ended his career briefly. They're the ones that had tried out some of these players, like some day when KT Bullets kicked them off their team, when they actually pushed them out for other players. So someday used to be on KTB, but then he got pushed out when Insect went to the top lane. And when they moved KT, Kakao over from KTA in 20, I think it was 2012, right? Over for 2013 to make him the jungler. So what happens at this point in time was for a season, you go and look here, you'll see the results are pretty shit, right? As KT Arrows, like as KTA, so look, they're doing nothing. Like the best thing they're doing is they made the playoffs once of winter, but they had a very different team here. This is back in 2013. Look, basically none of these players playing at this point in time. Then you go, that's actually the beginning of 2013. Then you go and you look later again. Okay, so they're not making playoffs in NLB. They're not particularly doing anything. They have some days at this point in time. They have Rookie still. They have Hachani still. They don't, have, they have Lyra, who obviously now people will know from Clutch Gaming. But at the time, not particularly good player. Zero, I know they, they believe it or not, was the guy, yeah, the support player who made it to the final of Season 4 Worlds 2014. But he actually played as a mid laner briefly in KT. Then they also... 
didn't yet have Arrow. So they get these players in, they get in Kakao, they get in Arrow, they go through the qualifiers, no problem. They come over here, but what's this over here? Look, they managed to go only into spring season. Ah, oh, that's kind of disappointing, right? And then they go over here into NLB. Not a lot going on there. They win champions and they don't make it out of the regional. So in the spring, there's the lineup that we want. They play in this group. That is a very weird group, I've got to say. Because this is the one where, quite frankly, it was the group that had some kind of bullshit results in. And I'm not going to be explicit about why. But if you understand the context of these teams and what was going on, it seems rather suspicious, right? So this is the group where you have the reigning champions. SK Telecom K has just come off an, an undefeated 15-0 and OGN Champions winter. They've won Worlds. They won the summer split before that. They're back-to-back -back champions. Incredible team, right? But this is the split where they have a big slump. They don't make it past the round of eight. They get banged out in NLB way earlier than expected by Frost. Yeah, they go over and win All-Stars in Europe, but that's about it. They're considered to be in really poor form at the time. In this particular group, KT Arrows tops the group. Hey, that sounds pretty fucking good, right? But this is the problem. They do it by beating Prime Optimus, terrible team. They lose to SK Telecom S, the sister team, which is along with Bang, Wolf, and Marin, but they weren't considered a great team at the time. Easy Hoon was the mid laner, and I think Hero maybe was the was the jungler, unless I'm, mis unless I'm misremembering that one. They actually managed to lose to that team 2-0, so kind of underwhelming, right? SKTS has never done anything in Champions at this point in time. But they then managed to beat SK Telecom K, the reigning champions of OGN, and then through bizarre circumstances where SK Telecom S, the team that beat Arrows, manages to lose to the worst team in the group and then lose the tiebreaker to their sister team. It's actually SKTK that make it out of the group. But whatever, KT Arrow, KT Roster A manages to win the group. Okay, that's pretty impressive stuff generally, right? Then in the playoffs, they immediately lose to CJ Blaze. Four game series, they win one series. This was the Neo Blaze lineup with Daydreaming and with Emperor, but you've still got Ambition, you've still got Flame, fabulous players, Lost Boy. This was this, the game where Flame pretty much carried the series, was very good on Renekton. So they get knocked out in the round of eight, that's it. Blaze goes on, okay, Blaze to be fair was one game from either making the finals or finishing third. Okay, pretty good team still, even though they're not the best team, but bordering on elite in Korea. So, okay, not the end of the world to lose to them. So now you come to the summer split. So the summer split, again, same lineup, nothing changed. In the summer split, they top their group again, Group D. Now, not the craziest group, comparable to the one before, except that you don't have a team coming in with the strength of KT, SKTK, although SKTK didn't play with that strength in there. No, now what you have is, you have, they tie the Stealth, who actually weren't a joke, because this is when the Stealth had Captain Jack over on their team, and actually had some promise as a lineup. You have, they went... 2-0 uh, TJ Blaze, the team that beat them in the playoffs, so showing some progress, right? Developing on as a team, the same lineup, even though CJ Blaze had their own issues this time, didn't make it out of the group stage, thanks to losing a game to, to Stealths. And then they managed to beat MKZ 2-0. MKZ, the most notable detail being that they had Mid King, the former pretty good mid laner at one point in time, for an incredible miracle from a couple of years back. And he was playing on this particular team, which was kind of like a, an amateur slash a semi-pro team. So they get out of the group in first place, and in the group stay in the playoffs rather, they get drawn against Najin White Shield. Now Najin White Shield has managed to finish second due to a bizarre scenario where they tied every game in their group. But to be fair, a very competitive group, like the most parity of all the groups. They get Najin White Shield, and it's a five-game series against this team that were the finalists of the previous split. So, okay, props to Arrows for winning it. Actually, White Shield even has an edge at one point in time in game five. It looks as though they're going to be able to win the tournament, perhaps. But Arrows comes back, they win, they go to the semi-finals. Who are they playing the semi-finals? They're playing SK Telecom S. Now, why are they playing SK Telecom S? Where are all the good teams? Well, the bracket for this tournament ended up with a bunch of strong teams on the other side. The two best teams in Korea were the Samsung teams. Now, Samsung White and Samsung Blue both went on the bottom side of the bracket. Stealths were kind of like an underrated, pretty decent sort of sleeper playoff team. And, and Samsung, SK Telecom K, well, yes, they were in their slump. They weren't in great form at this time. But even they're not a terrible team. And that's the bottom half of the bracket. KT Arrow's bracket, they've just beaten Najin White Shield. They've then got the sister of White Shield, Black Shield, who surprisingly won their group, but haven't yet like, developed into an elite team. And they have SK Telecom S, 
who didn't even make it out of the group stage in the spring, but for kind of dodgy reasons, but actually is looking pretty decent at this point in time, even though they come second in a group with Samsung White. So in the semi final, Samsung SK Telecom S, not considered an elite team. Well, if you want to give the props to Katie Harris for beating Najin White Shield in an elite team, now you've got to kind of give it away a bit that, well, they only went five games, they had to go to five games with SKTS to win the series. Now, SKTS were not considered a very good team at this point in time. Like, this was a team that was. They themselves only won in five games over Black Shield, who were inexperienced in the playoffs. This is a team themselves who don't have much playoff experience. This was a terrible series, by the way. It was a five-game series, but it wasn't a great series. It wasn't like a very like high-level series. It was like teams playing bad games over and over again. So somehow, KT Arrows makes the finals. Because they've come from the weaker side of the bracket, because they've played teams that, aside from White Shield, who people immediately then wrote off, I'll have some separate content where I redeem that team. Aside from them, they haven't beaten great teams to get here, quite frankly. So you look at them, and the fact that they're in the final, they were a massive underdog to Samsung Blue because Samsung Blue had won the previous split and had never been pushed to game five even. They've won every series here. They've 3 0 Stealth. They've 3 0 3 one Samsung White. They again have never been pushed to five games and Kate Garrow's wins only in five games and with blind pick as usual in the OGN format back then being the fifth game and epic finals. Like I would say some underperformance by off the top of my head. I think it was actually Def that had a couple of games that were a little bit dodgy. And also you have to obviously add that Acorn didn't do very well against um, Someday overall. It wasn't really that much of a mismatch. It was generally Kakao who dominated the series, was the MVP and made some key plays, especially in that game five, to win the series for the guys here. So the fact is, like this is a big outlier that Arrows wins this series. What happens after they win this series? How do they follow up on their success here, right? Managing to beat the best team in Korea, the best team in the world, and win OGN. Well, they go to the regional, and what do you know? They start out in round two. They play against Najin White Shield, the team that they'd narrowly beaten in the, in the round of eight. Najin White Shield's just beaten their sister team, Bullet. So actually, there should be even bigger advantage for Arrows. You've beaten the guys from White Shield already in a playoff series. They've just played your sister team and had to show a lot, presumably, to beat them. You should have all the info, everything prepped. No, you get 3-0 by Najin White Shield. Najin White Shield actually ends up winning the gauntlet, goes to Worlds. People then retcon that Najin White Shield was shit the whole summer. And at Worlds, despite this amazing gauntlet run, because people want to downplay Alliance, people want to make out like that wasn't that tough a group for Cloud9. Okay, more retconning all over the place. But you can see here, KT Arrows did nothing whatsoever in that gauntlet. They didn't even win a game. They just got 3 0 straight up, zip, and out of the out of the tournament they go. So I actually have kind of a problem with this one. This was easily the biggest fluke win, the biggest underdog upset in the history of OGN and LCK. And you've never had one since, and there had never been one like that before. Usually the team that won was literally always one of the top two or three teams in Korea. Usually it was the best team in Korea, won champions, won LCK, quite frankly. If not, it was the second or third best. It was the elite teams that won. This is one of the reasons why this was considered such an incredibly difficult competition. Now, this team came along, managed to just three to a bunch of teams, winning all these blind pick games. They had to carry Jongler, obviously a great kind of outlier strength to have to be able to win some games that maybe you shouldn't based on the strength of your laners. They bombed the gauntlet right out straight afterwards, didn't go to Worlds. They were never a favourite to win the OGN title that season. They were a dark horse, and even then, at best, you wouldn't even have had them as one of the top one or two dark horse. You might even have picked SK Telecom K to be a team that could have done it uh, on similar level to them. That shows how kind of lowly they were overall, despite the fact they had some promising players and they were an exciting team to watch because of Kakao and his trash talk. They had, quite frankly, the fewest elite players at their positions of any team that at that time or since has won the Korean domestic league slash tournament. Bizarrely, a bunch of them did go on to be amazing players after this or accomplish more, like win Worlds, be the best mid laner, be the best player in the world, be the best top laner, be the MVP of the league. They did do amazing things since then. And by the way, I'm with you. If they could have actually all been at their peak level at the same time and in this team, it would be an amazing team. It would be so stacked, right? You think particularly of the top side of the map, of Someday, Kakao and Rookie. If these players were at their career peaks all playing together, my God, I mean, it's like the IG team, the Invictus Gaming team that won Worlds now, arguably even better because they'd be all Korean, so they'd all be on the same page, the same communication. I'd argue Kakao at that time was better than Ning is in Season 8. You have, or in terms of relative to their time period, 
someday, okay, different type of player to the Shy, more comparable to the Duke, to Duke in that sense. I don't know why I said the Duke there. More comparable to Duke, but an extremely good player and a carry player himself and gives up so much space. Rookie, obviously, godlike player now, would be a monster with paired with Kakao back then, and then with a low econ, like, guy who doesn't need all the resources in some day, this would be an incredibly dangerous team. It's just the problem is that team never existed in terms of those players being at those peaks unless you retcon all of history and take all these accomplishments from years later, push them all back and say, well, it's the same name back then, so he was as good there here. And wow, no wonder this team won. No, it was a massive fluke win. This video was kindly supported by Dean Tanglis, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Gardner Wilson, Ollie J, Tobias Bernasconi, Nate D-O-double-G, James Harding, Kyla Harris, Travis Greb, Daniel Yordanov, and as always, a special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for some of my upcoming content? Perhaps you want to ask me a question in my monthly AMA. Do you want to see some teasers? See who's going to be the next guest on one of my shows? Maybe you want to take part in an esports discussion with me. Well, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.